What is up guys, Blood Moon Bobby here with another camera to check out. This time we've got the Panasonic Lumix G9. Um, <clears throat> this is the latest mid-level mirrorless camera to come out of Panasonic. And you know, it's weird. Some of you guys might be wondering, G9, what about the G8? Well, I first thought, oh, maybe it's like how in Japan the number four is unlucky, which is why um, sometimes when you see cameras like the Nikons, they when they went from the D5300 to the D5500, chances are they didn't make a D5400 because, well, four is an unlucky number. So I tried looking it up, and it actually turns out that Nine is actually an unlucky number, not eight. So I'm just like, what? Because I remember, I don't think they made a Panasonic G4. Let me just um, double check that. No, they didn't. Yes, I know there's a GH4, which just adds to the in inconsistency, but still. But so, but it's weird. They may as well have just called it a G9 instead of a G8 because some of these features are te teetering on, on being on a prosumer camera level. So, um, <clears throat> we'll get into that as we go on. So, the first new feature in the G9 is that it uses a 20.3 live MOS sensor. Okay, so in case you don't know, live MOS is a sensor size that is a little smaller than APS-C size and the reason Panasonic and Olympus go with the size is so is to basically combine the image quality of CCD sensors like on DSLRs from like the mid 2000s with the power efficiency of a CMOS sensor so um that's the idea in case you're wondering there's no optical low pass filter which means <clears throat> you'll get extra sharpness, is but you'll there's chances you'll get more more ray, especially if you take um fashion photos and if you look at the clothing, you'll notice some wavy lines. If I can, I'll try to have a picture in the video if you're watching this on YouTube. But if I can't, you'll just um see the spec sheet I have, and so no optical low pass filter and. Like a lot of mirrorless cameras these days, Panasonic has their method of taking higher resolution photos than what the sensor provides. So it has a 80 megapixel RAW or JPEG capture mode. And in Panasonic's case, the way the camera does this is it'll actually take eight photos and combine them together to get one shot. So again, this is the kind of thing where it's best suited for things like... um. <clears throat> Landscape photos, I wouldn't try doing this on things like fashion or sports because, you know, if the subject moves, it's going to pick up, the camera's going to pick that up, and you're going to end up with some ghosting on your image. So, it's nice to have um, if you're taking landscapes, though. And the camera itself, its in-body image stabilization is able to compensate for 6.5 stops of shutter speed slower than in usual so oh yeah you don't need a panasonic lens that has their new dual is 2.0 um technology how the g9 is able to accomplish compensating for 6.5 stops of shutter speed is that it uses multiple built-in motion sensors like accelerometers and gyroscopes to stabilize the image Curiously, the G9 actually doesn't have a hybrid AF system. It uses a 225-point contrast AF mode, which in the past I've seen Panasonic's autofocus, even when it was um, contrast um, detection, still perform pretty well. In fact, um, I remember when Olympus first came out with Speedy AF when they made the EP3. It was about neck and neck with Panasonic's um, camera, which I'm pretty sure was using contrast at the time. So in the case of this model, I wouldn't worry about it as much. Obviously, if you're going to be shooting video, you'll probably want to use a manual focus anyway. So, yeah, so we got a pretty decent sounding, and that's a lot of points, 225 points. I mean, it may not be as much as the number of AEF points on the Sony A7R 3 but then again, this is a prosumer camera, not a pro 
pro-level camera like the A7R III is. Of course, being a Panasonic, it has 4K video. It will actually record 4K videos at up to 60p, at up to 150 megabits per second. If you're shooting in 24 or 30p, if you're taking more cinematic video, it will still have a respectable speed of 100 megabytes per second. So just keep that in mind. You're going to be needing a really fast memory card. Or so definitely you'll want something that has like, you know, over 100 megabits per second. If you're just shooting a full HD video, um, pretty much you can pretty much put any modern SD card in. Um, 1080p videos can be recorded at 60, 30, and 24p. And the um, bandwidth range, or the ride speed, I should say, ranges from 20 to 28 megabits per second. There are mic and headphone jacks on this camera, so more pro level tools. And like a lot, and like um, <clears throat> current Panasonic um, models, you can and take either a 6K or 4K photo from the videos. So, you know, so if you've taken video and you want to lop off a frame to use as a still image, it'll um, come out as either a 6K or 4K resolution photo. So, still pretty respectable little stuff. Um, uh, this next part is kind of the bane of my um, existence as a photographer. An OLED EVF. Yay. Um, Basically, it'll look nice and saturated, but don't count on color accuracy when you're taking your shots. But the good news is that this EVF has a 3680K dot resolution and a 120 frames per second refresh rate. Doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be in slow motion, but it, it'll look um, relatively smooth when you look through this viewfinder. Thankfully, the screen itself has, I'm, I'm pretty sure, more color accurate um TFT LCD. It is a 3-inch LCD with 1040 K dot resolution. It's not as high as the Nikon D500, but again, prosumer camera, so it's probably a cost-cutting measure. And still, 1040 K dots or a million forty thousand dots, that's still a pretty high resolution. The G9's shutter cycle life is up to 200 thousand um times um so basically you can take two hundred thousand in photos before the shutter goes kaput um like a lot of prosumer um dslrs the g9 has a top lcd panel curiously um it with this top lcd panel you get shutter speed on the right and aperture on the left it's not a deal breaker but i just <laughs> kind of noticed um that's it's usually the other way around on DSLRs, but it's still not as nice to have, especially if you don't want to be using the screen. Um, I tend to use the top LCD panel quite a bit on my um, DSLRs, um, mainly because I don't like using live view. But in the case of the um, Panasonic G9, if you're just if you just want to use the EVF and but you need to look at your um, shooting information, you can use the top LCD panel to get a quick glimpse at your um, shutter speed and aperture. Panasonic claims the G9 has the world's fastest... Ugh. Uh, let's not say world's fastest because, I mean, who knows? By the time I get this video out, uh, maybe, I don't know, Fujifilm will come out with a camera that has the world's fastest AF. It changes all the damn time. And, but the autofocus speed of the G9 does sound pretty fast at 0 0.04 seconds, so it has that to claim. So don't worry if a, if tomorrow, from the time of this video, or whenever you're watching, when the next world's fastest AF camera comes out, uh, because the G9 should still have a pretty respectable speed. Unless Panasonic is lying to us. Yeah. And in case you're wondering, sports shooters, the G9... And continuous shooting speed is 20 frames per second with continuous autofocus or 60 frames per second if the AF is fixed from the first frame. So really good stuff. Um, one of the advantages of mirrorless cameras when it doesn't have a mirror that's constantly moving around and, you know, it has to um, flip down to check the autofocus like on a DSLR. So, um, yeah, so 20 frames per second with continuous AF, that's pretty good. 
And here's one of the features along with the uh, mic and headphone jacks that makes the G9 more of a prosumer model than its predecessor, the G7. The G9 will have a magnesium alloy body that is splash dust, splash and dust proof, and it will be freeze proof to 14 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 10 degrees Celsius if you live um, anywhere else in the world. So, so pretty um, pro level stuff there. And the G9 will have dual SD card slots, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and you can charge the camera's battery using USB type... What? Micro USB 3.0? Thin. Fragile. Warps. Very easily. Why is it... Oh! Okay, I'm done being triggered, but I'm just, it's just like even the Nintendo Switch has a USB type C port. Why Panasonic? Maybe that's why if you go on the Panasonic website and you look up the G9, you'll see oh USB charging, but they don't show you the port. You got to look in the tech specs. So, yeah, I mean true you know, micro USB 3.0 is not going to blow up in your face, but you got to be careful because it is such a thin connector. So um, be careful about that. I've had so many micro USB E cables where the um, cable gets warped. Where, where, yeah, it gets warped. Or even just from like sitting plugged into like my hard drive, you know, I'll look at it and I noticed you know, it's kind of bending. So just be careful about that. So not a deal breaker, but I really wish the G9 had USB Type-C. I honestly wish USB Type-C became the, the new widespread standard. I mean, it's growing in smartphones. And like I said, if even the Nintendo Switch, a $300 gaming console, well, has that port, I think pretty much every camera should have that port now. So, eh. <clears throat> but still, that doesn't ruin an impressive sounding camera. I'm sure the G9 is going to be a pretty cool option for the um, enthusiast slash prosumer customer. I mean, especially nowadays. I mean, I still prefer shooting on DSLRs, especially when I shoot sports. But I know there's plenty of people out there that are just fine with <clears throat> using an EVF. And honestly, you know, I can't really blame them. I mean, true, um, nothing is going to be more accurate than using the optical viewfinder and a pentaprism on a DSLR. But, you know, for the person who's mainly looking for good-looking images, but minus the DSLR size, the models like the G9 should be pretty good. Um, unfortunately, the G9 is coming out in January, so if you wanted to get this camera for your photographic friend, you, your friend's probably going to be disappointed. So, it comes out early January 2018 for a price of $16.99. Minimally, that does sound a bit pricier than I would have liked. Maybe, I would have liked to be priced maybe in like the $1,500, $1,300, for the $1,300 range, but... You know, hey, it's still a pretty equal sounding camera. So, alright guys, this has been Blood Moon Bobby, and thanks for watching, or listening, if you're listening to my podcast. Go follow me on SoundCloud, and subscribe on YouTube. Hey guys, this has been a Blood Moon Bobby video. Please like this video, or dislike it, and please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.